Heat Field will show that flying is not only a wonder of our own time, but a wonder of all ages to come. So if you're ready, we'll roll the film. As you know, it was the Wright brothers of Dayton, Ohio, who first achieved the dream of flight. They learned to master the air by flying a number of ever more advanced gliders. On December 17, 1903, an airplane they simply called the Flyer flew. Others, Europeans and Americans both, followed the Wright's success. Here we are on the Seine in Paris in 1905, looking at a float glider built and flown by the Frenchman Gabriel Voisin. In September of 1906, Alberto Santos Dumont, a Brazilian living in Paris, was the first to fly a powered airplane in Europe. Flying began to catch on. And Gabriel Voisin, along with his brother Charles, started to build and sell flying machines. An American copy of one of their planes is on display in our exhibition. When I was in Europe, I met a great many aviators who earned their wings on frail Voisin biplane. Pilots like Henri Farman and Léon de Lagrange. Robert Esmo Pelterie designed, built, and flew his own plane. In America, on July 4, 1908, Glenn Curtis won the Scientific American Cup in his famous June Bug. But it really wasn't until 1908 and 1909, with flights by Wilbur Wright in Europe and Orville in the United States, that the air age truly began. As Wilbur Wright prepared his plane, the Europeans really didn't know what to expect. They were proud of their own ability, but if the truth be told, were hard-pressed to make even short straight flights or simple turns in the air. Wilbur showed them what flying was all about. That's the crew hoisting the weight that will catapult Wilbur into the air. And there he goes! In the spring of 1909, Wilbur continued his triumphal tour of Europe. At a large military parade ground near Rome, he demonstrated the operation of his right flyer. As in France, he astounded thousands of spectators with the performance of his machine and the ease with which it could be maneuvered. He even found time to teach a selected few to fly. His first pupil was Lieutenant Mario Calderara of the Italian Army. By the way, watch that fellow running out behind the airplane. His job is to retrieve the device on which the airplane rode down the 60-foot rail. You know, these early Wright machines weren't easy to fly. With his left hand, the pilot controlled the elevator. That's the large surface in front of the machine that enabled it to climb or to dive. With his right hand, he operated both the rudder in back of the airplane and what we call a wing warping mechanism, allowing him to turn the machine and to balance it. Wilbur's month in Italy also marked the first time a motion picture camera was ever taken into the air. Here, we see that first aerial film. Note the constant movement of the elevator, which, as I explained, controls the altitude of the machine. See the small string on the upper right there, occasionally flipping toward the camera? That helps the pilot judge whether he's climbing, diving, or flying to the right or to the left. Simple, but effective. While Wilbur was amazing our European cousins, Orville was thrilling an American audience, which included President William Howard Taft at Fort Myer, Virginia, not too many miles from where we're standing right this minute. Because of a crash in 1908, while he was trying to secure an army contract, Orville had to return to Fort Myer in 1909. His plane, a Wright Type A flyer, became the world's first military flying machine and it's on exhibit here today.
That's Army Lieutenant Frank Long there with Orville. On the most important of the 1909 test flights, Orville and Lieutenant Benjamin Thuloy flew all the way to Shutters Hill in Alexandria, Virginia, and back an amazing 10 miles. Yes, 1909 was a year of triumph for the Wright brothers. Not only were they successful in selling their airplanes to the Army, but they also inspired people everywhere with dreams about the future of their great flying machine. 1909 was the year of the first crossing of the English Channel by airplane. The dashing Hubert Latham was the first to try. He flew an Antoinette IV, a beautiful machine with an extraordinarily successful engine. Regrettably, Latham fell short of his goal and plunged into the channel. He later made another attempt, but again was unsuccessful. Though hobbled by a badly burned foot, Louis Blériot, a wealthy French industrialist, was the next to brave the channel's dangerous open waters. He used his own Type 11 monoplane a later version of which can be seen in our exposition. Blériot succeeded, and in so doing, demonstrated how quickly our world is shrinking. No longer was England an isolated island kingdom. Just think, my friends, of the commercial and military potential of a machine that is able to cover the 20 miles between Calais and Dover in only 37 minutes. By the way, I must tell you that these film scenes are recreated since no motion picture cameras were actually present to record Monsieur Blériot's historic flight. Blériot became a hero in England as well as in France, and he immediately received a flood of orders for copies of his monoplane. Please be sure to visit the Blériot Company's exhibit before leaving the hall. The remarkable year 1909 also saw the world's first great air meet held in France at Reims. Tens of thousands of people came to enjoy the new sport of flying. Many were seeing their very first airplane, and oh, can you imagine their wonder? For never before had so many airplanes gathered in one place at one time. Pilots such as Delagrange, Farman, Latham, and Breguet became immediate heroes. Of course, Reims had its misfortunes, too. There were several crashes, but happily, no fatality. There's Eugene Lefebvre, a Wright pilot and one of the most famous of the early European flyers. But perhaps the hero of heroes at Reims was our own Glenn Curtis, carrying America's banner to victory in the James Gordon Bennett speed competition. Every day adds to the incredible tale of this gifted aviation pioneer. After the Reams meet, public excitement over aviation continued to grow. Here we see Henri Farman in an attempt to fly with two passengers. And here he is in his 1909 Farman III airplane. Samuel Cody, an American showman, flew in England. He built the first aeroplane purchased by Her Majesty's Armed Forces. Only two short years ago, in 1910, the Peruvian, George Chavez, gave his life in an attempt to fly the Alps. But his friend, Bielobuchik, succeeded in a safe crossing just a short time ago. Here we see the crowds awaiting the landing of Alfred Leblanc, winner of the 1910 Circuit de l'Ouest one of the great long-distance air races of our time. The race covered a circular course through eastern France, and LeBlanc, flying a Blériot monoplane, covered the nearly 500 miles in just over 15 and one-half hours flying time. A look at LeBlanc's face gives you some idea of just how grueling the race was. Jules Vedrin is one of the great speed flyers of our day. Here we see him at the finish of the 1911 Paris to Madrid race, as his Moraine monoplane is brought to a stop 
and Mr. Bedreen jumps down to accept the congratulations of his admiring public. Ladies such as Raymond de la Roche, the world's first officially licensed woman pilot, Hélène Dutrieux, and others are demonstrating that they will not take a back seat in this new business of flying. That's Alphonse Pegu, the great French stunt flyer, being strapped into his Blario. Alphonse defies danger and the laws of nature with his loop-de-loops and his parachute jumps. Now take a close look at this. Have you folks ever seen a loop-de-loop -loop before? Pegu deserves the welcome he gets once back on the ground. There are many aviators making history of the sky. The race between Claude Graham White and Louis Paulin from London to Manchester, England, thrilled the readers of the world's newspaper. Paulin won, but Graham White's brave effort to close the gap by flying at night in fog and very bad weather endeared him to his country. It's cold up there, folks. Notice how gingerly Graham White removed his gloves. Yes, the flying machine has taken Europe by storm. Multi-passenger machines are now taking to the air, and new types of craft, like the hydro airplane, are becoming popular. Here, we see one Curtis machine pulling away from the beach, while another runs up on the launch ramp. And back here in the good old USA, we're moving right along. Airplane exhibition teams, sponsored by major manufacturers like the Wright and Curtis companies, and independent pilots as well, crisscross the nation. Here's Arch Hoxie, one of the stars of the Wright team, in his Model B. And look, there's ex-president Teddy Roosevelt among the spectators. Arch was sure putting on a special show that day. Teddy never could pass up a challenge, and he just took off his coat and decided he wanted to go for a ride. I'll bet he startled a few people over that one. Teddy's put on a little weight since San Juan Hill, and these things aren't so easy to get into anyway. There we are, all set. And off they go. How many of you folks are ready to go up and see what it's like to fly? Well, Teddy seems to have enjoyed the ride. That's a Curtis Model D headless pusher. Mr. Curtis's company is selling quite a few of those planes, and they've become sort of a favorite of folks all over the country. Those of you who want can get a closer look at one of these planes in the exhibition hall. See those small surfaces between the two wings? They're called aileron and are used to balance the machine. Oh, I'll wager you all know who that is. It's Lincoln Beachy, probably the most famous and daring stunt pilot of them all. Link has built a reputation not only for his daredevil tricks and maneuvers, but for his showmanship as well. One crowd pleaser is a race between Beachy and his airplane against one of the country's leading automobile speed demons. He often takes on Barney Oldfield, but this time he's pitted against Eddie Rickenbacker at the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines. <laughs> Look at Link lap Eddie. It was really no contest, you know. That half-mile dirt track is far more to the liking of horses than racing cars. The plane can not only open it up down the straightaways, but can also bank into the turns at a far greater speed than the car. But it's all good fun, and sometimes Link flies so low over the car that the driver can reach up and touch the wheel of the plane. <laughs> Better take up flying, Eddie. Yes, the air age is upon us, ladies and gentlemen. So walk around, gaze in awe at the exhibit, feel the excitement of the new world of aeronautics, and dream with us 
of the future of the airplane. Now, as our pilot gives us a goodbye wave and we take an aerial look at Ms. Liberty, let me, on behalf of the management, invite all of you to enjoy your tour of our show. <laughs>